Special request to the man called Ola Danapan. Time for you know, man called Rapid. You better watch it, this a general sound. You better watch it, this a talk of the town. Cause they're rough and they come from my stem town. This a general sound. Say general. Cause land him as a body general. Say you land him as a body general. Land him get a hairy lick of his around. Cause all the people tell us to win very all. Cause that a promise is a comfort to a fool. Aye. Say that a promise is a comfort to a fool. Say that a who are the new who general? Aye. Say that a who are the new who general? Aye. Say that a funny man the new general. Say that a funny man the new general. Daughters, my boy. As innocent as children may be, they get into all types of mischief of one sort or another, and Doddis was no different. His reality was just a little more extreme. It is said that at around the age of 14, Doddis almost fell victim to the wrath of his father's .45 pistol. According to accounts, Doddis had fallen under the influence of some of his peers and had gotten involved in some senseless and unnecessary acts of violence, against both male and females in and around the community, creating needless problems for his father, who at one stage got so mad, it was rumored that his effort to reprimand Doddis, came at gunpoint. Average teenager? Not by a long shot. But to understand Doddis the boy, we must first understand Jim Brown, the man, because without grasping some level of understanding of Jim Brown the man, then understanding Doddis the boy will be literally impossible. Someone once said that when laws get involved, the lines that separate the heroes from the villains get blurred, sometimes even erased or replaced altogether. Some have argued that Jim Brown was such a man, a man who got caught up in the bureaucratic rigmarole of society's blatant twisting of what was once okay, but suddenly becomes outlawed for whatever reasons, reasons that those who were in control of legislature, saw his substantial rationale for said change. A lot has been said about Jim Brown, but according to his partner, Bev Brown, not Doddis's mother, in an interview after his death, she was quick to point out that Jim Brown was not the monster the media had made him out to be. Old people, they would come and hug him, kiss him. I know people love him off real because the person he is. Because the person he is. Always trying to help someone, say something to them. Word of encouragement, saying to the kids, talking to the kids, telling them that they must um, try to achieve a better tomorrow because you know they have to go to school and things in said interview she went on to say that he was a principal person a claim that many agree with but a claim also disputed by an equal number if not more because with a reputation like the one he left behind what principles did jim brown really stand on or for mayhem disaster and confusion forget the folklore, because from what we have disinterred, it seems that most of what has been said, was sensationalized for a variety of reasons. The truth however lacks no vibrancy, and with that said, these are some of the facts we uncovered. Although Tivoli Gardens and Jim Brown have been almost synonymous in mention for as long as most of us can remember, what needs to be made clear is that at the time Jim Brown allegedly took up arms, he was not at the front line of neither was he the topman in Tivoli Gardens, and he wasn't for many years to come. One of the vital nuggets of truth missed by most, is that Jim Brown's reign as the Tivoli boss was even shorter than that of his mentor, Claudius Massop, but unlike Massop, his reign had so much impact that it has overwhelmed and eventually, dwarfed, the memory of Massop altogether. To further clarify this point, what needs to be remembered is that at the time when Jim Brown was first shot in 1966, and rushed to the Tivoli Gardens Health Center for medical assistance, he was a mere soccer player, doing odd jobs and apprentice work, another youth from the inner city trying to see a brighter day. In the bigger scheme of things, Jim Brown was a little nobody, his involvement was from a spectator's perspective, like most members of the community. In the early years of Tivoli Gardens, 
the prominent players were Claudius Claudi Massop and Carl Bayer Mitchell, but eventually it was Jim Brown who emerged as the leader of what has become, Tivoli Gardens, a zone of tyrannical events. But how did all that come to be? After the demise of Tivoli Gardens enforcer, Claudius Massop, who died in a hail of bullets on February 4, 1979, the Tivoli Gardens reign of control fell into the hands of his chief lieutenant, Carl Bayer Mitchell. Mitchell's reign was however short-lived. Dying in January of 1984 at the age of 38, when he succumbed to what was said to be a drug overdose, he was a reputed cocaine abuser, which resulted in an opening for the then popular and only logical leader, Lester Lloyd Jim Brown Coke. Jim Brown stepped in after that officially, but even before Byer's death, he was already a shining star, and may very well be the reason why he was viewed as the one who had stepped in, to fill the breach left by Massop and not Bayer, just before the Jamaica Labour Party's landslide victory at the polls in 1980. Jim was more popular and flamboyant, he stood out, and even outshined Massop at times. Bayer may have been Massop's lieutenant, but he never had what Jim had, charisma and tact, even before 1980. When Jim Brown became the unofficial top man in Tivoli Gardens, he still maintained a high level of prominence and respect in the community, from the moment he was introduced to it by Massop. Unlike most hoodlums at the time, Jim Brown was a cut above the rest, street smart, astute and an attentive listener, traits that served him well on his rise to the top of the food chain. With Brown's initial ushering into the fold coming from none other than the top man himself, Claudius Massop, and him already having a reputation of not being a walkover, plus surviving multiple gunshot wounds, his respect came somewhat naturally, and with him being the man he was, Jim capitalized greatly. Jim Brown was an intellect in his own right. Ahead of most of his peers by leaps and bounds at the time. According to some, he always had a plan, a vision, even if it meant spilling some blood along the way, but be that what it was or wasn't, there is no denying that Jim Brown was a thinker. A man who came and changed the way donship was understood and administered. Before him, dons were always present in their communities, and depended heavily on political favors and handouts, but with Jim, all that changed. He was present but at times absent, away on business, raking in money that had no political signature or strings attached. He brought a sense of independence to the role of Don. He had a certain level of charisma, intrigue and even a little mystery about him, present but at times absent, and when he was absent, it was as if he was still there, because not only did Jart he, his son and second in command, look like him, he also ruled like him. Jim also started Jamaican gangland family dynasty. Since ascending to the throne in 1984, the reigns of West Kingston have remained in the Coke family. A move which is believed to be deliberate, due to him seeing the end of many a don, by the hands of those who were close but not related. His solution was, keep it in the family, hence the reason no one but his sons was ever considered or seen as his second in command. Jim Brown's lieutenant was his son, Jarty. Jim was also the first Don to actually move his family uptown, the suburbs, away from the mayhem and madness that he was responsible for in the garrison. He was also the first Jamaican Don that we can be said to have made an effort to give his children a first-class education. All his children went to prestigious and prominent learning institutions. So with Jim, not only did West Kingston have a new Don, they had new leadership. Jim brought a new swag to the era of Donship. He brought flamboyance along with a new level of brutality, but he also brought what seemed like hope, because unlike his predecessors who got just enough to get by at times, Jim had direct access to the wealth being accumulated by the shower posse, and he understood the people around him. He had learned well from his political teachers, so the trickle-down effect was in full effect in Jim Brown's reign. Hence the view of him being, the Don of all Dons. Note, before Jim Brown, none of the Dons, enforcers or strong men, were considered to be rich or living well. In most cases they were just above the average garrison resident, and more feared opposed to being respected, but with Jim, all that changed. 
he was both feared and respected, and with him also being rich and powerful, he became a literal magnet and a symbol of hope for the streets. Jim wasn't just a West Kingston Don, Jim was a Don, point blank and period, yard or abroad. And originally as Barbai, those who knew him say he was a tough, no-nonsense type of man, who once he had signed on to the JLP's philosophy, fought tooth and nail for his party's honor. His commitment however led to early accusations, and like Massop, Coke was soon nabbed by agents of the state, thrown behind bars and slapped with murder charges. But just like Massop, after a few months in jail, Coke was eventually freed after the main witness in the case, turned up dead. It was after that release from jail that Coke shed the moniker Barbie and took upon himself the nickname Jim Brown, after the American Hall of Fame football player, whom he felt was the perfect representation of who he thought he was. A larger-than-life aggressor. Coke honed his skills as a serious and feared enforcer during the political turbulence of the 1970s, when the rules of engagement in politically volatile areas demanded that the enemy be, as was said in those days, be pushed back. Such a scenario provided the perfect training ground for Coke and others who had subscribed to such a way of life. Their brutality didn't go unnoticed, and it soon became the fuel that propelled them up the political and criminal food chain. Call him a sentry, but Coke was responsible for keeping his political rivals at bay, who would oftentimes attempt to attack his community and inflict harm on its residents, a sad and frequent reality of the day. A lot has been said about Jim, but one thing that shouldn't be forgotten, is that like so many before him, he too became a product of a discordant political system created by both the Times, and some of Jamaica's early political leaders, who were desperate for power after independence from Great Britain. Enforcers back then were a dime more or less a dozen, expendables, but Jim Brown was determined to change the dynamics of that scenario, because unlike his counterparts, Massop and Mitchell, Coke was smart enough, early enough to wean himself from the breast of political nutrients, and could be described as the first political enforcer to free himself from the economic shackles affixed to them by the political power brokers of the day. Prior to and after the JLP's victory in 1980, Jamaica, which was one of the major suppliers of marijuana, ganja, to the United States, Canada and the United Kingdom, however, soon after the JLP's victory, Jamaica evolved into a major transshipment port for the more potent and deadly drug, cocaine. 1980 was a time of tremendous change and worldwide tension, and with Jamaica having a new regime in place, the JLP, the decision was made to align themselves with the United States in the Cold War, a clear sign that a new day had dawned on the shores of Jamaica, and under the US government's direction, to the disgust of many Jamaicans. The newly elected government embarked on a major ganja eradication campaign throughout the island. The Cold War was a period of geopolitical tension between the Soviet Union and the United States and their respective allies, the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc, after World War II. The period is generally considered to span from 1947 to the 1991 dissolution of the Soviet Union. The anti-marijuana initiative caused economic fallout between the growers and traders of the illegal crop in Jamaica, and literally forced drug traffickers to seek alternative means, alternate drugs, to make their money. Cocaine commanded a much higher market value than marijuana, and soon proved to be a perfect substitute for those involved in the illicit trade, who quickly diverted their skills to satisfying an overwhelming demand for the white substance, cocaine, primarily in the United States. It was during this time that it is said, Coke, along with his confidant, Vivian Blake, developed their massive drug empire, with bases of operation in Florida, New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Chicago and other parts of the United States. However, unknown to them at the time, operations of such magnitude were, and still are, literal magnets for law enforcement, especially in the United States. And just like that, the spotlights were on, 
with the federal authorities paying attention to not only their activities in the drug trade, but also paying equal and maybe even more attention to the brutal modus operandi of these Jamaican gangsters. It must however be noted that the Shower Posse were not the only perpetrators in United States at the time with Jamaican roots, because there was also the notorious Spangler's Posse which originally hailed from Matthews Lane, a PNP, People's National Party, stronghold, and an arch-political enemy of the JLP, Jamaica Labour Party, Matthews Lane is located within close proximity within walking distance, of the Shower Posse headquarters in Tivoli Gardens. The Shower Posse, so called, it is alleged, because of their predilection to spray their enemies with bullets, was so feared by their rivals, and created so much havoc in the United States, that the US government was forced to allocate a budget to facilitate a massive counter-offensive, aimed at destabilizing the gang in the 80s. Another problem. The Shower Posse may have been the ones getting the awards for callousness and brutality, but their rivals weren't choir boys by a long shot. When it came to violence, the Spangler's Posse were equally brutal in their own right. Someone once said, you can take someone out of the ghetto, but you can't take the ghetto out of them, and so it seems is the parallel, you can take them out of Jamaica, but you can't take their Jamaican ways out of them. So it seems was the case, because in a tragic twist of fate, it is said that the political differences that had been bred in Jamaica since the 1940s, was nonsensically brought to the streets of North America. A move in itself that literally made no sense, outside of stroking personal egos, and adding more nails to the coffin that the feds were already building by this time. While Blake was known as the brain behind the empire, Coke was known as the muscle and the provider thereof and in the process, became so wealthy, that unlike other dons, he could literally ignore political handouts, which to him by then, were being dispensed in too little portions and at too slow a pace, by the powers that be. Money and power however didn't change Jim Brown, at least not when it came to politics. He was a laborite first, and was still adamant about his political duties, moving at them at times with even more vigor it seems, than when he was broke. An incident in 1984, made that point clearer than ever. Reportedly, Coke led a team of men from his stronghold of Tivoli Gardens into Wilton Gardens, also known as Rima, then a JLP-aligned community, which was ran by orders that came directly from the Dons in Garden, another name for Tivoli. For years Rima was regarded as a sort of second cousin of the more developed and powerful, Tivoli Gardens. But Rima had itself spawned fierce street warriors who were hardened in the art of criminal warfare from their daily experiences, derived mainly from a living in an area which was the first line of defense against PNP thugs who launched repeated attacks from the neighboring Arnett Gardens, political rivals and a PNP stronghold. A disagreement between fractions in Tivoli Gardens and Rima had prompted Coke and his gang's expedition into Rima, and when the gang left, seven men lay dead. The dispute was said to have been over weapons belonging to Tivoli Gardens, which were in the hands of men from Rima, who had refused to return. Shortly after the incident the police arrested Coke and charged him with seven counts of murder, but Coke was again freed, after no one would step forward to testify against him. On the day of Jim Brown's release, heavily armed men celebrated openly in downtown Kingston, firing a barrage of shots in the air, directly in front of the Supreme Court, an act that sent police officers, court staff and civilians in the city capital, scurrying for cover and shaking in fear. It was all smiles as he emerged from the courthouse and was held high by the crowd, before being whisked off to his fortress in Tivoli Gardens, like a king after a victorious crusade. In a matter of days after that blatant disregard for the law, then, Prime Minister and Member of Parliament for West Kingston, Edward Siaga, along with other JLP officials, visited Rima and appealed to the residents to let bygones be bygones, a request that was hard to fulfill, and an even harder pill to swallow, with lives lost, but for whatever the reasons, eventually it was, 